Hi, this is Brennan Davis from Bedrock Games and the Bedrock Blog, and I'm here with Joel Clark, and we're doing a new segment on the podcast called Wusha Workshop. Uh, it's a new segment, so we're going to sort of hash out some of the sections of it uh, as we go here. But uh, first, uh, Joel, why don't you introduce yourself, because you're, you're new to the podcast and people might not be familiar with you, so uh, why don't you tell people who you are? Okay, well, um, yeah, uh, my name is Joel Clark, as you have expertly uh, <laughs> brought up. I've never done a podcast before, so it's going to be really awkward. My apologies to everyone. I'm here with my, my four-year-old. I'm watching him today, so he is a little bit... There may be some, uh, some interference from this little guy. Uh, what I do is I'm uh, kind of a budding game designer. I'm, I'm working on a game with a, a small team right now called Tian Shang, uh, All Above Heaven. Much like you, it's I, I'm making kind of a, a wuxia game. And that's pretty much it. I'm otherwise just a forum guy, and I know and enjoy yeah. RPGs a lot. And uh, and we've bumped into each other online. I've I've been watching his YouTube channel. He's seen some of my stuff, and so we you know we realized that we had a lot in common, and so we, we thought we would we would try doing podcast here and seeing what we what kind of uh, topics we can cover. We might go beyond the wuxia genre. This is just for right now. We're calling it wuxia workshop, but we'll see sort of where that leads us. Um, so one of the things that we, we wanted to do initially is sort of uh, a segment where, where one of us presents the other with, with a movie or a book or a show that they haven't seen and kind of gets their reaction and then maybe talk about it in gaming terms. And so uh, this time around, I decided to, to uh, share uh, Swordsman 2 with Joel. And, and so I don't know, what, was your, what was your reaction to the movie before we get into the gameable stuff? All right, so um, Swordsman 2 was really cool, and, like, it struck me, like, when I was watching it, immediately one of the things that it, it presents that I thought was really nifty was, like, there's not an ounce of fat on Swordsman 2. Like, even just in a little opening crawl, it's like, okay, you know, this is happening, this is happening, smash cut, this is happening. And it was almost like watching, like, uh, early 90s MTV uh, videos, where it's like, there's no, there's no breathing room, it's just like, bam, bam, bam. Even when there's breathing room, like even whenever there's these little quiet moments, it's all like it all has a purpose. There's no there's no excess, and uh, it was it was really like it was really watchable because of that. Uh, and that's just like on a technical side. Like as far as like the content, it was great. <laughs> it was one of those great and, and Wushi is great great for this because like it rides that line between like just a little bit hokey, kind of like the old '60s Batman show, and like genuinely like thrilling. Um, sort of like. Uh, Actually, it's kind of like it's totally completely distinct, but really similar in experience to like watching Twin Peaks or something like that, where it's got like these kind of like soap opera y elements. Yep. Like the it's a little maudlin. There's, um, there's melodrama so, at work in it. Yeah, and it's got, but the dramatic parts they sting really deep. Like there's some actually really nifty stuff in there, and there's a lot of variety too. There was a lot of like I didn't expect there to be a lot of comedy in it, but like yeah. they cut up and it's really fun. It's what's so funny too is how how much it can shift tone and the shifts actually complement each other. So like you have the comedic beats and then but then you'll have these really melodramatic moments like in the final battle when 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 they're uh, when they're confronting uh, you know the uh, invincible Asia. Uh, you know it, 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 it's and, and, and the uh, and the and the character's name is uh, Dong Feng Bu Bai, but the uh, but in the in the you know the, in the I think in the in most of the subversions they 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 go with Invincible Asia or Invincible East. Don't, don't like they that. don't they introduce the character by name and then they immediately start using uh start using like the the fighting name like the little nickname? Yeah, they do. But see, so but the thing is, if you listen to the dialogue, a lot of time, like I think Invincible Asia might have been the related to the, to the nickname. I literally had a cat astrophe. Sorry. Oh, that's also okay. The, I, cat, cats will cat, cats will take you by surprise like that. Um. But uh, but what was I saying? Oh, so the, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, okay, it's I remember a, now. Uh, uh, I I think I think it I think it was a nickname. Oh, like but, the actual but sometimes will actually say like Dong Feng Bu Bai. Yeah, sometimes they were actually the saying Dong Feng Bu Bai, and they would just say Invincible Asia on the on the sub. Yeah, that, that happens a few times, and like. You don't even have to be learning. I, what are they speaking Mandarin in that one or some I think some it's dialect? Cantonese in that one. Is I think it? It's Cantonese. Is it? But the, but uh, okay. my DVD well, has both the Mandarin and the Cantonese available. So 
Um, yeah, but I mean, like, and this happens to me when I'm watching uh, French films too, or any, any subtitled film, where the character will clearly say a phrase, hmm. like, especially a name, and then the subtitle will be the wrong name. And it's like, we know, guys, we can hear. Yeah. We, don't even, we don't have to speak the language to know you're wrong. But, uh, but anyways, you know, the, but, the, but I think that what was interesting about it was sort of how, how melodramatic that confrontation was. And, you know, and, 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 and yet it's, 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 got, you know, all this humor sort of leading up to it. You know, you, you, it's a, it's a, it, the, the movie is kind of all over the map in terms of tone. Um, it is, but it's got such a unity to it. And I think that, like you said, part of that is because of the contrast. Like the same swordsmen who are cutting up so much in the, uh, the early parts of the movie all die hideous and heroic yeah. deaths at the hands of Invincible Asia. Yeah. And like that contrast is enormous. Yeah, because they're all kind of just goofy background, like they're singing and they're 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 always having fun in the background throughout the movie, and then they just get obliterated, like they, like literally they get obliterated by her. She just they you know they, you know they explode. Um, oh yeah, not, there, there's not nothing left. Yet. Like when I say hideous, it's gruesome. It's, and like, the movie's bully puzzles. It's like yeah, they don't just die; they blow up, and you see that, and you see giant sprays of blood, and then like. They have to bury all of their friends, and it's just this really... What a contrast. You know, what movie have you seen that does that? You know, it's like if at the end of The Mask, Jim Carrey fell into the printing press, and there's just gore everywhere. It's like, holy God. Yeah, and, and, and there is there is a fair amount of... In, in, in 90s Wuxia, they do tend to crank that up quite a bit. In uh, um, It's always clean, though. I think you'll notice, like, even though, like, guys are getting dismembered by an attack, it's not, it's not horrifically gory. It's... it's uh, there's something dry about how they're, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's almost, um, I don't, I don't want to call it like artificial, but it does feel a little packaged. Like, cause in this movie, if you just described, Oh, Hey, there's this character that you meet him and he's on meat hooks. And then later on, a bunch of needles fly into his eyeball. That sounds like David Cronenberg levels of gruesome, yeah. but actually not really. Yeah. It's, it's cut and presented in a way where it's sort of hygienic almost. Yeah. Like initially when you first see him, it's kind of, you, you kind of, cringe a little bit but then it just becomes like a feature of the character he's just got these hooks that you know it, it, and <laughs> and uh and 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 part of that too is maybe the time it was made the effects are sometimes not a hundred percent uh convincing um but uh but yeah i i it's 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 interesting sort of how it it, it walks this line between dark and and humorous uh and I don't know. I, I think it's a great movie, though. But what did you think in terms of gaming stuff, like in terms of gameable content and uh, how you would translate it into a game? Well, like, it, one of the things that struck me about it is that it was really, like, the, the motivations of the villains and heroes were all really comprehensible. And uh, the, the main character, like, his whole thing, and I, I know you've had players like this, who's like, I want to retire, I don't want to bite me the hooks, I want to leave, I'm not interested. And I love that the movie keeps organically drawing him back into this this really unnecessarily horrible conflict that's going on. Because, I mean, I don't want to call him a voice of reason exactly, but he almost doesn't have a dog in the fight. There's this one hot girl I met one time. I don't want my friends to die. I've got one promise I have to keep, yeah. you know? And, like... That was beautiful. Uh, if you ever want to treat us as a GM on how to draw a recalcitrant player into the game, watch Swordsman 2. <laughs> because, like, I almost... It, you could almost see the frustrated GM, like, look, man, I, I got all this stuff going on. Look, it's Master Wu. Oh, look, it's Invincible Asia. This, this is a magical text. And the guy's like, I get drunk again. <laughs> yeah. And, like, it's, it, that is an RPG. That's exact. That almost describes the it's last like session. A, he's like just the DM is just throwing all these hooks at the at the player, <laughs> who just wants to go to what is it Mount Ox and uh, uh, and and retire from the martial world. Um, and and also, I mean, one of the things you see in the movie is that he probably wasn't unwise to want to do that because the, the you know there's consequences the deeper he gets drawn into this conflict. Um, oh, yeah. And, it, and it even in the end, it's, it's not from it. <laughs> it's clearly not worth it in the end because then he ends up on that list. And, you know, there's uh, the, the whole, you know, the whole purge that takes place after the. Yeah, it's, it, it's like clearly the same. You know, yeah. we still have an evil, super powerful woolen warrior killing people because. And so it's like and he's like on the boat and he's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> 
That was really great. I actually really liked that, too, because it's one of those things where, again, and this happens in RPGs, where you will set up the next campaign sort of by accident while you're running this one. Because why wouldn't that guy go insane with power? I mean, he's pretty effed up because he was in a dungeon for all this time. And, well, why wouldn't all these things start happening? And we never really did resolve this plot thread. Now, what, what do you think about the displays of power in there? Because there are some, you know, there's like the star-sucking skill where the guy just puts his hand on people's heads and drains their life and seems to empower himself with it. Um, I, I put rates in my games. <laughs> but, would you, but do you let players take those abilities on? That's where... It becomes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the thing. And here, here's a rule I live and die by as a GM. These people like me a lot. If it's in the game, the player should be able to use it, or at, at least kill it. Usually use it. Because, like, I, I like whenever, and this, this is the thing that's legitimately happening in the campaign, I'm ongoing campaign I'm running. Uh, the players at early level, like level four, all traded a Child of Destiny, which was the original idea of the game, for three dragon eggs, which, and so they now have dragons. And each one of them has a freaking dragon they go around with. Mm. One of them has a wraith that is basically a player character. So it's straight up a wraith plus character levels. And this is an old school game, so that's really powerful. And we just keep on trucking. Because, I mean, like, if the players are exhibiting interest in doing something, I mean, why not let them? Well, exactly what are you protecting as a GM? And that's that's one of the things where it's like, I if I was running... Swordsman 2 and like one of the characters was like hey I want to know that like life sealing touch I'd be like okay you know what, what that's going to entail you got to get that scroll from him and you've got to train and master it before he kills you and then you've got it yeah. and then that's what the campaign's about so it, and it is important to remember that one of the caveats of that is don't introduce something in your campaign world that will obliterate it don't put don't put the church of the bomb in your game unless you want that unless you're cool with that bomb going off no, that well, and I think I think when GMs do sort of resist, what they, they, that's what their fear is. They're afraid that the campaign is going to implode. They're afraid of the church of the bomb. Yeah, um, which I mean can happen. I've certainly I've introduced things that in hindsight I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't have introduced uh, that. You kind of you have to. I don't know. I, I feel like if you don't allow that mistake to be made occasionally, though, you 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 can really sort of hinder. Uh, you know, a lot of fun. Uh, you know what I mean? You, you yes. Could, so it's it's it, it, it. I guess the question is, what what do you do if you introduce the Church of the Bomb? What what what's your solution? At, you know, if that's happened. Okay. Well, I actually i i got i got a get out of jail free card with that almost exact situation because that wraith touch thing. Okay. Didn't realize this. Here's the thing that wraiths do when they when they drain someone with their wraith power, it makes a wraith out of them. There's no upward limit to this. Mm -hmm. That's that's basically a zombie apocalypse right there. So whenever I put one of those under a player's control, I was like, oh no. Because <laughs> he went and he, he immediately started killing people in the city. And I'm like, I don't mind the city getting nuked. What I mind is an unstoppable force of, of wraiths mm -hmm. just sweeping over the world and annihilating it. Like, that's a that's one step too far. That's the Church of the Bomb. Yeah. Now, I gotta get out of jail free card. Uh, circumstances happen to conspire so that the wording is kind of vague on who's in control of those race and so what i ruled was okay you can make the wraith but it's its own wraith and it hates you okay because all right that's a fair that's a fair way around I, th I think there's a number of solutions there another one that i would sometimes do is i would say okay you want to be you want to be like the uh the the evil overlord who controls the wraiths the whole world is going to 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 hope for your destruction now because you've just become right. a big bad what? in the setting, and so there's a, yeah yeah there's <laughs> always that, that option. That's always sort of, that's like the final sort of thing. Like if the player if the players get that powerful, you can lean into it. Um, but but I would only do that if if it was clear to me that like everybody at the table is kind of okay with the things going in that direction. Like if you have yes. one player who's leading an army of undead wraiths. And everybody else is resentful towards him. You could have a problem on your hands. Um, yeah, but yeah, uh, and that's true. That that kind of goes to uh, the other thing I was going to mention, which is if I hadn't gotten that out of jail free card, my next step would have been to just discuss it with them, like adults. Like, hey, look, um, you guys realize that this is what the the campaign is going to be about, and that it will end on this note if we go down this direction, because it's literally the Church of the Bomb. I, well, not literally, but it is yeah. effectively the Church of the Bomb. Honesty like, is a really yeah. good policy. Honesty, like, just telling your players if something's a problem when it happens or, you know, a lot of times I think GMs will 
they they want to put on a veneer of omnipotence around sort of you know I'm the GM so I not you know nothing. I, I don't make mistakes or anything that happened was intentional the whole way through. Uh, and so if you, when you drop that veneer, genius, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it gives you way more opportunities to just speak directly to the players about, Hey, I wasn't huh. expecting this to happen. Uh, you know, what do you guys think I should do? You know, like you can, you, you know, you, the, the, it, it, it helps open up the conversation to other, other possible uh, ways of dealing with it. Um, all right, and so the next the next thing we wanted to talk about today was uh, problems in design, and the topic that you were interested in was uh, bringing genre show elements into a game without doing like a trope list or getting overly complicated, and just general thoughts on the topic. Um, so I don't know what, what you know what, what were your what were your thoughts here? Uh, well, one of the problems, one of the persistent problems, especially as a younger GM that I ran into was. Um, What's been termed other places content delivery, uh, where it's like, and this is kind of the my method, just to kind of give you a little insight. It would, whenever I used to GM, and kind of I still do this, I would uh, watch a show or read a book, and there'd be something cool in it, a particular kind of monster or a trap or something, and like my my instinct, of course, was, ooh, I want to put that in the game because usually games are a pretty big chunk of where my where my cognitive space is, and like it's. It's difficult unless you have a really kind of disciplined way of doing it to know how to to introduce that little chunk of content into a game without, like you said, like going to like sort of a, a more abstract way of doing it. Like we're going to do this genre today, kind of thing. Uh, that that can be really disruptive to the flow of an ongoing game. But you can still take those like little uh, tidbits and put them in a game. Um, and uh, one of the ones like. Uh, we were talking about this before, where, like, one of the things in, in Swordsman 2 that was really cool was whenever they, they spring Master Wu from what can only be described as a Wuxia dungeon. And, like, that's one of those things where, like, you might be tempted as a GM to, like, just be to take an ongoing campaign and just start a session framing them in a dungeon and doing, like, a media res and assume that there was oh, a set I of see. sequences yeah, that led them to that, so you could have that scene. But you could also just, like... Another way to do that would be just to write down, okay, if they're captured by this adversary, that's the beginning. Like, that is, instead of having a media res thing, you have a way to hook it in. Because uh, a lot of times, like, if you get captured, as if, if your party gets dropped unconscious and not killed, like, there's always a sort of question of you wake up in a dungeon or you're dead or some yeah. twist of fate. But having something ready for that is completely reasonable as a GM. Okay, you're kept alive for political reasons that make sense, and now let's start the dungeon. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, like, that's, that's kind of what I was talking about, where it's like, if, if you think in terms of, like, how can I put this into an ongoing campaign when it comes to, uh, to any kind of content, any idea or anything you want to grab and toss into your game, uh, there's a way to do it without being abstract or without, like, being too... Like leaning too much on that, the GM gets to declare where and when things happen. Yeah, you, don't, you So you're sort of arguing, thinking more in terms of, um, of of allowing events to kind of freely flow from one to another, rather than thinking in terms of this is how the movie was structured, so I should yeah. structure it like that. I I would agree with you, and I would say one of the things like uh, the whole thing with Dong Thing Mumbai and 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 why that situation makes sense is we know that there's there's a lot of possible motivations going on that would 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 lead Dong Feng Bubai to put him in in prison like that, and and so it would be easy if I was running that character if I understood the character as well as the screenwriter clearly does. When that character, like if it so happens during a game, defeats one of the players, you know, would would just decide to imprison them rather than kill them, like you're saying. Um, so I think I think knowing your NPC motivations is huge. Because it opens up that kind of a possibility uh, naturally. You can just, you know, like whenever, whenever I have characters being uh, attacked by NPCs, one of the things that I always sort of think about is, are they trying to kill the party? Are they just trying to stop them? Uh, you know, what's their like? What's their deal? Do you know what I mean? Like, what are they trying to do? What, here? Why I rolled Noel on the encounter list. Why are Noel's here? Why yeah. are they trying to kill the party? Yeah. Because there's this whole dimension of. Uh, I think D and D especially gets really badly pegged for this, where it's like, okay, so you roll on the chart, and the chart makes a monster, and the monster fights your heroes. 
But, like, that's the stereotype. But reality is that chart is supposed to represent what they're likely to encounter in this area. They won't necessarily attack immediately because, like you said, they have a reason for being there. And if they encounter the party, that might not be a let's kill each other thing. Most of the time when I roll random encounters in my home game, it's you come across someone doing something or something doing something. What happens next? And in a lot of cases, like, they'll just make friends with it. Uh, I've got a I've got a chaotic party, so like there's so many like vampires and necromancers and gnolls and things like that where they're like, oh yeah, we we tight. Yeah, no, <laughs> Just... that, that can happen. That can definitely happen. And I and I and I do think the, the it, it, it's it's something that you sort of develop over time. And and I'll and I'll admit too, it's also in large part how on the ball you are that day as a GM. Some days you're not going to run encounters as well as other days, but whenever something comes up on that chart, I you know. On a good day, I'm thinking about the motivations and about, is this person hiding anything? Is this person, you know, what do they want? And so if a fight occurs, I, I know where they're going to go after they've just, you know, if they if they incapacitate the party, what they're going to do with them. Are they, you know, the party is either going to die or that, you know, there might be other things that could happen. Or that, you know, like, and, and that opens. And if you're, if you're thinking in these terms, this kind of storyline that we're seeing in Swordsman 2 is always a possibility hanging in the background you know it's always something that could happen depending on the circumstances so um so i think i what i've learned with genre elements is you kind of have to be open to them emerging naturally in play and not worry about forcing them in play sometimes and if you have yeah. enough awareness of the genres and 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 and, and, and the and the sort of things that need to exist in the setting that allow them to sort of emerge naturally that they, they will emerge. Um, but, uh, but again, I think, I think, I think for me, at least a lot of it comes down to knowing the character motivations. Um, yeah. But, and another thing um, that I think that probably you and I think I do too, kind of naturally do as experienced GMs and people who have an idea of a genre that they're going towards in their head, when you make NPCs and when you role play the NPCs, you do that by adhering to those tropes. Like, you know, of course, of course, uh, Invincible Asia is is motivated by power, but also by passion. Yeah. And like, so um, you you already have the character doing stuff that isn't necessarily like rules optimal for killing players. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you sort of send the signal to your players that, hey, look, that I'm playing fair with yeah. the NPCs. They have motivations like you. They want non murder based stuff. Yeah. And you kind of you build that trust where then suddenly your players are like, well, I can do that too. That would be really cool. And then suddenly you're having a lot more fun because you're not locked into this GM versus player thing. What, what I try to do is I always try to make my NPCs have – there's usually the potential to negotiate with them. Do you know what I mean? If, if you can negotiate yes. with somebody – and any character that can be negotiated with is a lot easier to understand – Every once in a while, you probably will have these characters that just want to destroy the party because they're in their way. But for the most yes. part, I, I, I don't think that's how I want most of my NPCs to operate. So uh, You certainly want that to be the universal case where every bad guy is a gibbering madman or a crazy wizard or something. You know, you want a little more depth than that. Yeah. And even, even the gibbering bad guys, I'll usually have them have some trait where they're, where they're willing to yield if somebody will at least give in in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's you know, cool that, too. You know, it, 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 I think I think it. I think um, I, I think that you know again, character. For me, it boils down to character motivations and 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 knowing that not all encounters have to be about the destruction of the party or the party destroying the other side. I, I, yeah. I'd also file it under stuff like running away, like yes, encouraging the players to run away, and a lot of times. You just have to say that, like you said earlier, just being kind of conversational with your players, mm -hmm. being able to just to tell them, hey, look, you, I, I'm not doing a, a challenge rating thing. You might run into a dragon, and it's completely acceptable in universe and out of game to just flee because yeah. it will annihilate you. That's fine. You can be clever if you want to. You can try to parlay with it. I don't care. But point is, your character can die, and I'm, I'm not no kitty gloves. So yeah. like, if you want to run, that's a viable option. Just even just saying that to your players and meaning it and following through on that. That has so massively improved my games. No, I, I like doing that. I, and I also, one rule I have that I always employ in my games is having an option for people to use either, a, when, when they attack you, they can do it with lethal intent or just with intent not to kill you. So that if they were to reduce you to whatever the game's, you know, uh, 
uh, way of dying is, whether it's you get reduced to zero hit points or negative 10 or you get injured a certain number of times. Um, when you get to that point, if they're doing it non-lethally, you, wouldn't, you presumably wouldn't die. And what I usually will tell people during a fight when I want them to know, when I want to remind them that this is potentially a lethal encounter... You can tell the guy's sword strikes, he's trying to take off your head. Like he's, you know, this guy is trying to kill you. Or if that sword strike hit you, you would have been split in half. And, <laughs> you know, like, like just giving them very strong indications if it's not sinking in. And I'm also happy to do exactly what you're saying. Just sort of step aside for a moment and say, hey, look, this is like a, this guy huh? is going to try to kill you. And, you know, running away isn't, the, isn't, isn't, uh, isn't, a uh, 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 something that's off the table, uh, you know, I, I think uh, my attitude is to I like to be lethal with the party, but I also like to be fair about it. And yeah, that, that's a good way of characterizing it, too. And like um, I notice you, you're doing there like you are doing one of the jobs that is very, very seldomly ta- talked about in GM circles, which is you are honestly reporting what the character's eyes and ears tell them. You know, if that would have hit you, it would have torn you in half. And you can tell that because it does tear the stone behind you in half when he misses. You know, like, that not only adds something cinematic to a game, it is informative. And it's it's doing that little thing that a lot of GMs neglect to do, which is don't be, like, don't be tight-fisted with handing out detail and information. Tell them. Tell them what they see and what they infer. Because, like... That's, you're, you're their eyes and ears. They have to be able to rely on your narration yeah. to understand and get information from the world you're describing. And it's and it's honestly, I think it's the hardest part of GMing. Like, and I and I won't, I would never be the one to say that I'm great at it because I definitely <laughs> have been known to leave, leave out details. It's like, oh, you mean Brendan? There was a stairway there the whole time that I could have walked up. You know, I, I've certainly done those kind of things. But <laughs> I've been but so I've... roasted by my players for that. <laughs> by the way. I mean, it happens. <laughs> it happens. You know. Uh, but I, but I've also learned that's one of the tricks I've learned is that like when somebody, when it, when 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 you want to demonstrate something's gonna kill the party if they don't, you know, either run away or defeat it, you know, letting them know the effects of its attacks can be very useful. Uh, and and you can I think you can communicate information that they're able to logically deduce. You don't have to be yeah, coy that's, about that's it. That's important. You don't have to leave like you don't have to go into full on conversational out of game, hey, this will do X with X number. You can just say it within the context of what they could reasonably infer as a, as, as a character in that universe. Yeah. Like that I, really helps them stay immersed. I, th- I think that's helpful. I know sometimes it, it might, like, it, it's it's sort of a, a line for some people because not everybody wants to get to the point where they're, you're kind of telling them what their character is thinking in a way, but I feel like it's, yeah, it's not, it's that's not, it's not, not yeah, it's not. It's not like I'm saying, "Hey, you feel sad about it." I'm just saying you realize this. So you realize this is a sorrowful event, and mm-hmm. that's a good point. There is a world of difference between this is a sad thing and you feel sad. Yeah, um, and that's that's one of those other little lessons about being a GM that no one really seems to talk about. Where it's like, "Hey, the players get to play the characters," and there's some whole game systems where like they don't. That lesson isn't part of their fabric. Mm-hmm. Uh, like White Wolf is, is kind of notorious for like having the game play a character in some systems, and like yeah, I can, I can see where that that sort of that idea got lodged into people's heads. Well, I guess there and there certainly is probably a split around 100%. sort of that play style. I've encountered that when I talk about investigative games with people. That's something that comes up. Where are are you playing Sherlock Holmes or are you simulating a uh, an investigation of a of a Sherlock Holmes? Or are you simulating a Sherlock Holmes novel, um, like or, or story? It's a uh, those are two different things. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of depth to that discussion too, um, because like you get into the the point, and because that's along the same sort of argumentative lines uh, that that me and Jurg clash on. He's one of the designers on Tianchang when we got to social mechanics, because there there really are kind of two camps with it where it's like on the one hand what you say is what the character says the arguments you make should be convincing in the context of the universe but on the other hand what if you are kind of a social dullard but your character is socially really capable and there's there's two different ways of looking at it you can look at it more mechanically you can look at it more uh, more like in a, in a in a role play sense where you're like getting into that character and so you are responsible for what they say and like <laughs> We are both on opposite ends of that spectrum, so like we went out like cats and dogs over what the social mechanics would look like in the game. Ultimately, it, it, it was a very productive conversation, but 
uh, to the point, uh, there are good there are good elements of both arguments. Is what I ultimately it's, learned when I got over myself. Yeah, that's one where I've had to sort of learn because I had very strong opinions about I felt things should always be in character and spoke. You know, yeah. Because yeah. because because well, just to give some background, the thing that it, uh, you know, going back to the three point five days when three point five first emerged, one of the things that really bothered me was um, the bluff role, the bluff skill and and things like that. Uh, because I, I preferred the, uh, uh, the 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 I, I preferred that the that the players uh, speak in character, and I found that sometimes they didn't when when you had social mechanics like that. But yeah, I also sort of realized over time not everybody agrees with me, <laughs> and and yes. usually Ooh. when I'm in a in a group, a substantial number of people like those social mechanics, and yeah, and so a split is is my experience yeah. because there's basically two ways to look at it. Yeah. And so I think I think finding the right way to do it so that you can you know I mean, you, you basically have two options you you go or three options you can go completely one direction completely the other or you can find a way to sort of bring those two houses together and it's hard to do it is it is very tricky it's, it's so um, they're so mutually exclusive because one is literally talking and one is literally just doing math and so like it's yep. so hard to reconcile those those poles. Yeah, I suppose what, what what I've done, and I, I again, I don't think it's a solution, but I think it's uh, it's sort of what works for me. Is if it I ha- I ha- that is a solution. I'm sorry. <laughs> if it works for you, that is a solution. Yeah. I'll take it. So what what I do is I use the social mechanics. I allow people to have social skills in the game, but I use them as sort of like a uh, a backup system when it's not clear to me as a GM whether somebody should have been able to convince somebody of something. Uh, be, because either there's a great disparity between the skill of the player and the skill of the character, or because what they're saying either doesn't, you know, maybe it doesn't sound very convincing to me, or I just feel like it's fuzzy. Like, I don't know how this NPC would react to what that person just said, so I'm going to make you make a, you know, deception roll or something. Um, that's how I use it. But I, but I always start with the interaction. Do you know what I mean? The interaction is the most important thing. And, and, I, and I won't roll unless I feel like I need some clarity on uh, and that, that the, 90% of the time that works for me. Um, yep. uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm pretty happy doing it that way in an ideal world. I wouldn't have to even worry about, you know, people making, you know, social roles of any kind, but it's just, you know, these people are split. So, uh, so I don't know, but I don't know what, 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 what did you guys end up deciding on? Um, ult- ultimately we went kind of similar to that. See, in, in this, this is the argument of Jurgs that convinced me. In I've I've heard this this kind of a chestnut of that argument, which is, well, your character can't you as a person can't swing a sword, but your character can. Mm-hmm. So why can't my character as a person do this this social thing that I'm not capable of doing? And I I do happen to have some friends who are pretty far to the autistic spectrum, and for them that was a really big thing because part of the fantasy for them is my character is really socially capable, and I was like, okay, you know what? That's that's fair. It is a fantasy, and part of the game is facilitating the fantasy of that kind of heroic empowerment, especially in our game, where you're like DBZ levels of powerful. Um, so what we wound up doing was kind of what you did, but additionally, if a player just feels more comfortable just kind of um, leading with the mechanics, as long as it's clear to everyone what's happening, like I am convincing him based on this logic, I can't make that argument as a player, yeah. but my character certainly could, it's fine to lead with the mechanics. So that was like our ultimate compromise, where it's like, look, either of these mutually exclusive things can work, but both of them should agree on how they are working. Uh, so okay. that's what we wound up doing, was it's possible to lead with mechanics if you really just, if it makes sense that they're possible. Much like you can lead with violence in a fight, but you couldn't lead with violence towards science. <laughs> like, you can't solve every problem by just yeah. rolling bluff, to give you an example. Yeah. But if it's reasonable you could bluff someone, and you have an idea for a bluff, you can then just translate that mechanically if you're more comfortable with that. However, you have an advantage if you're able to do that just as a person, much like you have a tactical advantage if you know something about strategy, mm-hmm. even if your character's a strategic dullard. You can't ask players to handicap themselves mentally or socially to play your game, but you can say, look, if you happen to be socially adroit and you make a good argument, that's fine. You don't have to have the mechanics yeah. to, be, to say something clever in character or to think something clever in character. 
So that was that was our solution. And like as you can probably tell, a lot of thought went into that because the the, the way it, what, what it happened was it came up. And then, because we were in a team, part of that was the storming of us just basically bickering about it. And then we sort of went into our camps for a while. And then when we came back, we both had time to ruminate on it for like a month or more. And so we were like, well, productively, what can we make out of this? So that's a, that's a very developed um, way of solving that, for the record. Well, when, you're work, when you're working with people, there will always be those kinds of conflicts. And I find that uh, being able to put the ego sort of, you know, aside and... And do what's best for the game is the is the is the solution. Sounds like your solution is one though where if I want to speak in character, I would be able to, and I would be able to understand the character who isn't. Right? Is that sort of the the? Yeah, because the... even if they would, don't use those words or say those words as a character, they at least have to give an idea of like the gist of what they're trying to yeah. say, the they're trying to make. So even if it's like you say, I I, I swagger it and say, you know. Uh, three three beers for me and my mates, and then they're like, okay, so my character will go over and will 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 say he doesn't want to drink, and he will give this argument that he is is given a, uh, this magical vow that he can't drink, and that's what he'll do, and okay. like that's fine because even though you're you're characterizing it different ways, what's happening is agreed upon. There's a conversation going on. These are the elements of it. And you can you can communicate that however you're most comfortable with as a player. And and honestly, I think that gets it. That's really the problem that arises when you have this split in play style uh, that sometimes pivots around mechanics, but can also just pivot on how people deal with the mechanics. And mm-hmm. I, I think that uh, that that's a good solution because what I've noticed is you'll have players that come in and the I mean you can quibble over whether the character should be talking in character or should be you know first person or second or whatever, but the the thing that seems to trip people up on the other side of the fence is they're not getting information about what that person is doing. The person is just saying, I, I roll to do this. And yeah, I roll just, diplomacy to get yeah, this. Yeah, like, I roll to attack to take his hit points away. Yeah, and, and then people don't really know what's going on, and then they kind of lose track of everything. So I think, I think it, it at least gets over that hurdle uh, there. I, there's also a time and a place for that kind of thing, too, because like even in a game, like I tend to run games where people will speak in character for the most part. But there are times sure. when players are not comfortable talking in character about certain things, and they would oh, much yeah. rather shift to another way of talking about about the game. Do you know what I mean? So it no, I useful. totally know what you mean. And even with even if they love talking in character, a, a sensitive subject will come up that has like an emotional complexity to it, and they don't want to have to act that out. Yeah. So they're like, my character will kind of feel and say this. As a matter of fact, and I want to I want to make sure I, I mention um, Jenna Morin in Chubo's uh, Marvelous Wish Granting Engine. That's one of those kind of art house RPGs that I I sort of I've got kind of a thing for it. She actually put a pin in that. She was like, okay, there, there's a word we're going to use for that. We're going to call that emoting. You don't have to act it, but you have to say my character emotes this way. Mm. That was a really clean way of describing it. I thought, and so I've always thought of it in terms of you can emote with a character without necessarily having to act out that emotion. That, yeah, that I like that. idea Cause again, I, I, I do prefer when things are in character, but at certain points, like, I don't know if you have, if you have a character falling in love with an NPC, that's not always going to be comfortable for everybody. And, 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 it's one, and, and that's across the board. Like I find very few players that don't at least get a little bit awkward if something like that comes up and it's easier yeah. to sometimes work around it. Uh, and so ha- having something like that, in your in your tool belt would be you know that's that's a good way to do it i think sometimes um especially if you want to have that in your campaign like i do like having romantic storylines and sometimes if it's clear people are comfortable it can be spoken of in character um you know you can also do the thing where it's spoken in character but there's enough of a everything's being held at arm's length that people don't feel awkward about it but uh, there comes a point whenever I'm playing the girl in a relationship, and one of my really butch dude friends is playing the guy. That both of us are like, have we crossed a line here? Are we in a magical realm? And that, I think that's a good point to sort of like distance yourself from the character you're portraying. Yeah, uh, for purely social reasons. Well, also, I mean, if it's like, I mean, there, it, it, and it can happen with, with anything. Like if you're, if you, you know, like if I have like female players and I have an NPC who is, you know coming on to their character that could be awkward so it can yeah, be much you easier sure it's a clean yeah. line between what you're doing and yeah. like and that's just going to being basically socially courteous when you're gaming with people yeah. you know and that's but again like you said it's good to have that little technique in your bag because i've seen a lot of gms 
a, a lot of new GMs will not understand that there's that little there's that little line you don't want to cross there. And here's a way. Here, first of all, be aware of the line, and second of all, here's how you deal with it when you get to the line. There's a nice, socially game acceptable way to do this. Yeah, um, yeah. It's good to have those conversations. Well, I think it's something that it's always worth talking about too, and it's always like um, you, you got you, with with romantic threads in a game which again like we're you know in wuxia th- romance is a big feature Got to have it's, romance yeah you, it, it's 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 something that's very prevalent in the genre but it can be it can be a challenge and it's not and everybody i found everybody kind of approaches it differently so i kind of handle it differently in every group depending on on what everyone seems to be okay with and i'll often have conversations with people between sessions to kind of get a handle on it um but I think the yes. key thing is I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable during <laughs> during the romantic moments in a game. Yeah, dur- um, during your elf game, and that's that's another point that like I don't want to like diverge too much on this, but I do want to like you know kind of draw a little attention to it. People's comfort level in a game should be similar to if you were playing Monopoly with them. Mm-hmm. You know, like you don't want to. I know there's like some emotion and there's some like there's some degree of acting and like and a, sort of a social dimension to role playing games. But, like, if it ever becomes less conversational and casual than a Monopoly game, if people start actually getting upset or uncomfortable, like, again, if it was in a game of Monopoly, you'd definitely call the game of Monopoly and talk about it, you know? Yeah. So that's that's one of those things where that, and that has caused a lot of arguments online. People, like, t- trying to figure out where that line is for people kind of organically. There's different ways of dealing with it. Well, it's tricky too because I think some people are better at sensing when there's discomfort in the room than others are, and it's when it's when it's not being sensed that people sometimes have the uh, the issues can sometimes emerge when when it's when it's being when it, if you're if 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 the if the group is perceiving it and addressing it, it's not a problem, um, and so you know I I just find that you have to you have to kind of have your antennae up for that sort of thing. Um, it's true. Know, yes, must be sensitive to it. Uh, you know, again, it, it, I think it's less of an issue if romance isn't a theme in the game, but if it's something that's coming up and, and NPCs and PCs are having relationships or PCs and other PCs are having relationships, it can be, it, it can be, it, there, 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 there's some pitfalls you can get into with that sort of thing and you want to, yeah. you want to try to avoid them. Um, or at the very least have a technique for extricating yourself for them, which I think yeah. we've covered pretty well now. Yeah. And so, uh, so something else. So, so that was, uh, you know, one one of the sort of design issues we were talking about. Um, one that I had been contending with uh, over the past couple of weeks is dealing with the afterlife in, in games. Yeah, and, yeah. Tell me about that because that's a huge problem in my game to the degree where I don't even have afterlife in my game. So I want to hear like everything. Just just blow me, man. I'm interested. Okay. So it's it's a long story. For me, it all starts with um, Pu Song Ling's strange tales, which are these sort of uh, strange accounts of you know spirits and ghosts and things like that. And there's a lot of them that deal with the afterlife. And there's also a movie called Heaven and Hell by Cheng Che, where he shows the characters uh, going you know into hell and having to fight their way out. And and so in you know in in Wuxia, if you're using like a, a you know either if you're using the actual Chinese cosmology or if you're using a vaguely Chinese cosmology, uh, you have a lot of options for for the afterlife. And one of the cool things about it is oftentimes the afterlife isn't that different from the real life. There's, there's still bureaucracy, you know, in the afterlife. There's 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 a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that sort of make the afterlife gameable. Because you can still throw similar types of threats at the party, and and so what I've been doing is I've been working on this sort of variation on my core game based on uh, strange tales, but because I want it to be like a horror game, I wanted I, I had to have different scale in terms of wounds and how easy players are to kill because I wanted them to be easier to harm so that they're more frightened. Uh, but then when I started thinking in terms of setting. I was sort of going all over the place in terms of I wanted it to be like a dream realm, but I wanted it to be kind of like Ravenloft and be this realm that pulls people in. Or I just want it to be like a one-shot deal where I just, you know, I want to run a Strange Tales session so it can take place wherever I want. But over time, it became like an afterlife. And, and so I started doing this thing where if player characters die, they wake up in the world of Song Ling operating under the rules of the system that I've created for that game. So they make a new character based off their old character. And 
has slightly different stats, but pretty much similar to the guy who just died. And now they're in this landscape of the afterlife that they have to navigate before they are uh, brought before the one of the magistrates of hell who is going to sort of send them on to their next incarnation. And the idea is, the gameable point of it is, that I give them an opportunity when they first land there to accrue merit or accrue goods so that they can bribe the magistrates and hopefully <laughs> return to life. Um, so it's sort of a, a way of getting back into the setting uh, when your character has died. Uh, but... I, I have to emphasize the way that I've been running it. You have like a five percent chance of success. It's very, it's a, it's a long shot, but you know, it gives you sort of a last ditch effort. It also helps you determine, you know, what happens to your character in his next incarnation. So, say down the road, a player wanted to uh, play a reincarnated version of one of their old characters, they'd have a sense of of what that character became. So, that was sort of the general idea. I'm still sort of working out the kinks. I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of still sort of thinking through all of the implications of it. Um, That's cool, though. Like, afterlife as adventure, kind of? Yeah, like a place, like, you kind of, like, fighting in hell is kind of the idea. Like, uh, you know, again, the movie the movie that really inspired the thought was the Heaven and Hell film by Cheng Che, where character dies, and he he ends up, uh, you know, or the... Oh, like the, the, I think they call it the, the Buddha of Mercy appears down there, and, and because he was a good person, it, it gives him the shot of fighting his way out of hell. And, and so he literally, you know, he has to fight his way out. And, and it's Chinese hell, so it's Diu. It's not like uh, the Christian version of hell, but it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's subterranean, so there's some similarities there. And it was, it was, a, it was a very, oh, go ahead. You're a lucky man when it comes to your chosen hell because there's a lot more negotiation when it comes to Chinese hell than yeah. Christian hell. Like Christian hell is all like, you know, abandon all hope. You're going to learn a moral lesson for all eternity. But Chinese hell is a little bit more like I storm in and scribble every all the magistrates' names off of uh, off of this. So now the baboons are immortal, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, yeah, you could do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Journey to the West is a great. Um sort of uh foundation that that was that was that was sort of like i would say my starting point was journey of the west and my ending point was strange tales in terms of what i was going for and uh it, yeah it, you, you and you also have the, the 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 fact that the that they're bribable that you can you know the the, the, the currency might carry, like still have some effect in the afterlife if you can get your hands on it um so, and that's such an angle and uh but what I did was I created like a, a forecourt to that part of DU in my setting. So there's like a, there's this, and that is sort of the more Ravenloft type part of the the afterlife that where, where the adventure potentially takes place. Um, and so, I don't know, it, it's sort of a, a, a an amorphous dreamscape at this point is the way that I've been using it. But, that uh, makes sense. Yeah, but it's, it's tricky. I mean, afterlife is a funny thing. Like, uh, you know, sometimes you're better off just, you know, when a character dies, just not dealing with it. But I've, uh, I've had, I, I've, it originally the way that I did it is there would be a percentage chance that when a character dies, they might be able to appear before a magistrate and make their case or, you know, and so that's sort of where it started. And, uh, I, I think hey, there's, no, oh, go if ahead. you're being fancy, you could tie the percentage chance to some kind of like karma mechanic. So the more karma, the better the chance, like one for one. Yeah, that's that 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 would be the way to do it. That would that would be the correct way. To do it. I, I noticed that, and, and you, I noticed when when in the stuff that you've been doing, you you definitely seem to have the the, the karma thing going on. So I, I like that that that's present. Um, I actually, uh, I read the Bhagavad Gita, the the Indian holy text, in preparation for writing the karma mechanics. So that's that's pretty authentic stuff. Okay, um, yeah, I was wondering because. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I correctly use the term dharma. I. I and I, I make it a more proactive force. I think a, a lot of times, like, since there's not a lot of... Pe people in America that I've talked to, like, we don't really have a whole lot of workable, actual knowledge about, like, Eastern mythology and religions. So there's the, all this kind of persistent meme that, like, stuff like Buddhism is this really passive religion where, like, you're not doing anything and that's what gets you karma. And there's, like, a little kernel of truth to that. But, like, the original concept of karma, and, like, and this is in the Bhagavad Gita, was, okay, I know all these guys on the other side of this army are your friends and family, but it's your duty to kill them because you're a soldier, and that's your destiny. So go do it. And that was, like, 
this horrifically difficult emotional thing to do and physical thing to do. And yep, that's your job. Go do it. Um, so yeah, it's much more proactive. I think that people give it credit for. And I tried to reflect that in the mechanics where it's like, you have to do something to get karma. You can't just expect that stuff to happen. Okay. So, uh, going back to like some of the, some of the difficulties I see with characterizing the afterlife as an adventure is that fundamentally you are splitting the party, which, which is a big no, no in the, in the, in the world of role playing games. You've got three characters mourning over a body and one that's going on wacky hell time adventures. So like, what's your reconcile for that? Like what's, what's your technique for that? So I think it is an, it's an issue. And, and the way that I've dealt with it, the way that I bring the party together is when the remainder of the party goes to sleep, they can join him uh, in the afterlife as like a projection. Of, now the conceit I had in this, cause it, it hasn't come up that much in my games. Cause I'm still sort of fleshing it out. But the last time this happened, the character died, and he went to the afterlife, and he went there, and he, he found himself, like, basically, I turned, if you've ever seen the movie Legend of the Mountain, I turned that into an adventure. I just used that as my location. And I had a... I haven't seen it, but now I got to. But, it's, uh, but, but basically, I just took an image from a movie and made that, like, okay, this is where he is now. And, and then I decided, okay, there's a fox family that's got a great calamity hanging over their head, because there's, like, a bunch of Pusong Ling stories that do that. And and uh, and there's this swordsman who's going to come and murder them in the middle of the night. So they're going to ask him for help. And there's all this other stuff going on. And so eventually he meets the Fox family. He he he, he agrees to help them. And and uh, and the Fox performs a ritual which karmically ties them together and brings them into the events when they go to sleep and the, when they're dreaming. Um, oh, that's so. Cool. so so we ended up with this weird mini campaign where every night they would go to bed and they would join him on his quest. And then in the daytime, he was alone. And in the daytime, they'd be doing their other thing. That they, so the party was split, but it was split in a way that was like everybody was kind of happy with it. Like it didn't bother anybody that they like he, he he was able to do his stuff in the dream world. They were able to join him enough and they were still able to accomplish things during the day. Um, and they weren't really doing a whole lot during the day. So it didn't matter. Um, so so it worked. And uh, and I think I even had, if I remember, the events were mirroring sort of the real world. Like there was also uh, an actual swordsman that the party knew in real life that was going to kill a family of foxes that lived by their sect headquarters. And so oh, it was kind of like this weird sort of connected thing. Um, but it was fun. It was it was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, again, I think I think you have to do it with the. It definitely depends on the group, though. You know what I mean? Like, some people are going to yeah. dig that more than other people. I, I don't know, man. That's that's pretty poetic. Like, I, it'd be hard to not dig that. That's really cool. Um, I was thinking, like, when you were talking, like, you know what would be great for Adventuring of the Day? Uh, having a mechanic, like a haunting mechanic, where, like, your, your ghost is just kind of, like, hovering around the characters. And, like, you can do super minor things, much like in the, in the movie Ghost, where, like, you can, like, nudge something... Or like you let them like re-roll dice because you got this little like direct line to fortune or something. I, so you actually you can still do something a little more proactively. I think that is a cool idea. I like the idea. I always think about ghosts in my campaigns. And so like if, if people... One thing that my players have learned in my games is if you kill somebody, that's always a possibility depending on how the killing is done and what happens. And so I did have a player in one of my, my campaigns who murdered a woman. And, and, and she was his lover. And... And uh, and he murdered her out of convenience because somebody else in the party wanted thought that she was a threat to everybody else and convinced him to commit the murder. And so it was Ooh. this great act of betrayal. And then on top of it, when the player killed her, he decided to say and he like whispered in her ear, like, I'll see you in the next life or something like that. And so I, I just I, I mean, you're a GM that, that that's like that's, that I think it's like a silver platter right yeah. there. <laughs> so 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 she became this massive ghost that was haunting the party and they, they had to contain her in a in a chamber and uh and then they eventually ended up i think they unleashed her somehow down the road she got they they, they but but it paid a lot of dividends in the campaign it was definitely one no of these kidding. things yikes uh but God. yeah I, I think i think but 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 see but that was an npc what you're saying is they'll allow player character to become a ghost which i think is even more interesting um because it would allow a character who has died to still sort of stick around, 
um, if you want that character in the session. Um, it, it might even be a good way to like get around the issue of, hey, my character just died and I don't have a new character yet. Um, so that they have something to do until the end of the session and then they're, uh, you know, they're able to, they're still able to interact with things. And then after the session, maybe they're the haunting fades. Um, That's really cool. And you can like have a mechanic where they could only talk to people that they knew in life. So that's why they're hanging around the party. Cause they can like whisper in their ears. So they can still role play like, and they can, they can scout around because they're incorporeal ghosts. <laughs> so they could be like, you really shouldn't go in that room. And I got a feeling guys, we shouldn't go in that room. Yeah. I've got that feeling too. It must be the ghost of Flea Mubai. Like, <laughs> it's great. It's I, I love, I love kind of rolling with that stuff. Um, and I think, uh, <laughs> The thing about ghosts is you kind of you you have to have rules. I feel with like with when you 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 don't necessarily have to have a rule beforehand, but you have to establish what the ground rules are if you introduce something like that. Um, oh yeah, it's it's definitely something that could uh, uh, players are going to ask what the parameters are, um, and it's a lot different. I think if you hand a player that kind of ability than if you have an NPC doing that ability. Um, I think um, what you want to do with it. And I mean, this is any mechanic or any kind of like situation that's really off the walls like that you throw in a campaign, is you sort of want to don't present the, the player with a solution. What you want to present them with is an opportunity and a puzzle. Yeah, you can see anywhere in the whole world, but when you do that, you only get to communicate one word of that at a time to mm -hmm. someone every X minutes. That that you know, so that's really useful, assuming there's no time limit, you know? And then you just introduce a erupting volcano and everything's gravy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, it becomes a puzzle for them to solve, so they have a new advantage, and they've got to think of a clever way to use it. Because, and you don't want to make that like too restrictive. Don't assume that there's going to be one solution. Just make it something where it's like, all right, I don't know how you're going to use this, but it's definitely a challenge that I would enjoy. No, I like that. I like that. And um, and I just wanted to uh, sort of keep things going here because I know we got a time limit. Yes. But what's the uh? Uh, you would we one one segment we wanted to talk about today was uh, solutions in design. I know you wanted to talk about Vor, uh, Vorheim. Uh, oh yeah, so, I'll gush about it for a while. Uh, I just you want to start off with me gushing because I can gush. Yeah, why don't you talk about it? I'll, I, I have I have a paltry example, so you can we can lead with your stronger example. Okay, well, should we finish with the stronger example or, or no? Let's 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 put our best foot forward there. Yeah, okay. we'll, yeah but best foot forward and we'll, we'll, we'll end with my, 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 my wisp of an idea. Okay. So, um, a little, a little background about like my experience with Vorheim. I'd heard about it a lot, uh, in like, uh, OSR circles, like the old school Renaissance circles about like, Hey, this is really awesome product. That's for city adventures. It's a city adventure. And I'm like, okay. And it was talked up a lot. And so my imagining of it was this like thick tome, of, like, here's this one city called Bornheim, and here's all the stuff in it. But when I got it, and it was, like, it was a fairly cheap book. I was like, wow, this is really inexpensive. When I got it, it's, like, almost the size of a hardback pamphlet. Mm -hmm. It's super tiny. And I was just like, what? This? How did this get talked up so much? Um, but when I started reading it, and I started kind of grokking, like, what it was actually, I realized that in the tome that tiny, it actually contained almost every city in every role playing game I could ever want to play, because it didn't it didn't give me a fish, it taught me how to fish when it came to making cities interesting places in RPGs. And like that's one of those things where like I think most GMs are comfortable doing like a dungeon crawl or maybe even a hex crawl. But like a city crawl, usually like whenever my players go to a city, it's like we need to get supplies, hire a cleric, and find an inn. And then I'm going to get drunk because that's fun. And the most character most of my cities would would have had before Vornheim was like maybe a how drunk did you get table and what what crazy thing happened. But like Vornheim is is a product that is like okay so here's a bunch of situations you could find in a city and some reasons to adventure there, and here's how you can you can turn that into gameable content. And like I've legit had whole sessions like the the first twelve sessions of my, my Carcosa campaign was in the city of Carcosa with almost no originally generated content. It's all just stuff where I would just roll on a chart or, or use one of the little die drop methods from that book, and I'd have I'd have a, an NPC, a situation, a building, all the surrounding buildings, the traffic on the street, the street plan, 
And there would be a reason for all this stuff to be in the game. It wasn't clutter. It was like, if the players needed an escape route from the building they were burning down, we'd figure that out with the charts. Okay, okay. Oh, just a second. I'm talking. Hey, this is a scary part. I put on Howl's Moving Castle for him. So okay. this is his first time watching it. And I haven't watched it in years. And I'm like, I'm occasionally looking over. And like, there's a guy who's like bleeding ooze or something. And I'm like, ah, I forgot about that part. <laughs> I don't think it, I've it, seen that one. Um, Ooh, you got to see Howl's. It's another one of those very gameable kind of movies. Uh, anyway, d- d- back back on course with it. Like, okay, so if, if the player... It, it gives players reasons to be in cities and stay in cities. Mm-hmm. And then it, it gives them challenges and puzzles and content for those cities. So, like, it makes any kind of city that you had sort of vaguely in your mind as a GM... Like, if you just had a hex and you wrote the city of Greyhawk or whatever on it, you didn't really know what to put in there. Yeah. You could just start rolling on the Vorheim charts and be like, oh, okay, well, I'll put this guy in there, and then there'll be this plot. And then, and there's reasons for players to get involved with it. There's interesting stuff that happens. It's, it's amazing. Um, now, how, so it's now I'm, I'm not as familiar with Vorheim as some of the later stuff, so how, yeah. how, uh, how broadly... A- applicable is the material in terms of like going beyond uh you know like osr 1e could you you know is it is it uh is it usable in other genres and other systems is it is it you know how would you describe it in those terms oh yeah and that's actually an awesome question because a lot of times you'll get a product like that that feels like a sort of a universally useful rpg product but it'll be really wed to one kind of system but what the genius of the of the book is that it's not what it what it doesn't generate like numbers and stats. Mm-hmm. What it generates is like a floor plan for a building or okay. a structure plan, or like the names of, and motivations of NPCs. And you could use that or those same kind of techniques. You could just transport those techniques to almost any role playing game you could think of if there was a city in it. So really, mm-hmm. as long as there's a city, you can use Warnheim, which is amazing. Okay. Another and one so, of the reasons. It's, and so, uh, if I were if I were using it in like a different kind of setting, the only thing it sounds like I might have to change is maybe the names. Like that would be the one thing yeah. that I might want to have to tweak just to adjust for for flavor purposes. But otherwise, it shouldn't be too difficult to transport into oh, yeah. into my Arabian campaign or my Arabian Chinese, yeah. you know, whatever, what have you. And yeah, and it's not so much genius in the content that is in it. The genius of the of the work is in the. Uh, the way it sh- it shows you how to how to prepare that content so it's ready to game as soon as you need it with not a huge amount of prep beforehand. Like there's a there's a list of a hundred names. You just roll a d100 and it's got first name, last name, and then some weird thing about them, and then a little piece of treasure or motivation for them. Mm-hmm. That's a great chart to have on hand, and you could populate that. Like you could use if you have more of a Western style campaign, you could just use that from the one in the book, or since you now know that that's a great thing to have, you could make your own version of that chart with, like, say, you know, ancient Arabic names and, like, setting specific details to it, and it works just as well. It's it's the, the technique that you take away from the book, and that's where the warning really shines, is in showing you these techniques and how useful they are for running a game. Well, it sounds, too, like... I mean, one of the things I remember... One of the changes I remember seeing was sort of a move away from random tables... I don't remember exactly when, but during the course of my my you know my years gaming, uh, it oh, definitely yeah. kind of fell out of fashion. And I feel like <laughs> one of the really great things that the OSR has brought back uh, is is that is just that the utility of these tables, like you you really can get a lot of function out of tables that uh, you know like in the in the '90s and early 2000s they wouldn't have seemed very sexy to people because it's tables with you know a list of things in them. But they they really have a lot of function. Um, yeah, and they they really do have a like like you said a functional angle. Oh, look, you put the whole you put the whole. Uh, it's really great. My my boy put a flower in a, in a little purse for me. That's really cute. Okay, and like you're saying, they they have a function. They're not they're not really interesting pros. They're not specific setting material. They have no wedding to a meta plot. They're they're really light functional things and yeah a screwdriver isn't super sexy but how many times have you needed a screwdriver in your life and not had one well especially so, when you're gming when you're gming you oof. fall into these situations where you might run out of gas or yeah you, you might hit a wall all yeah. the time 
<laughs> tables are a great way to sort of say, okay, I'm out of ideas, but this table's got some, you know, is going to force me to think in a new way. Um, not that you're out of ideas, but you know that you're just going to keep using the same idea again and again if you sort of press yourself. And so, you know, it can be useful to have something that forces you to shake things up. Um, oh, yeah. My, minor diversions on that point. Almost every time I use NPC voice, when I, when I do a little silly voice, it winds up being this kind of smug sort of voice like, oh, I am this NPC. So uh, recently I've been writing down who they sound like in my when I first – and one of them – and I thought this guy was going to be a minor NPC, and they did kill him almost immediately. But the point about this, I, I wrote down he has Skeletor's voice. Okay. And so when I met him, I, I said that, and then I did my Skeletor voice, and yes, I am Skeletor. He wasn't Skeletor, he had some other name. Here's the horrible thing. The voice outlived the character, because not only did they kill him, they did it subtly, and this guy was, like, draped head to foot in these magical robes, so no one knew what he looked like. So now I have a, a player who's constantly acting like him, so that he's in charge of that guy's kingdom. And he has to do the stupid Skeletor voice, because they think it's still him. <laughs> Okay, that's so. Uh, yeah, it's easy to fall into little uh, little traps by doing like the same voice, or like you said, introducing the same kind of content because you have your favorite stuff as a GM. Um, but whenever you write stuff down, especially when you make it to charts and things like that, you'd be surprised how much fun and, like you said, mileage that adds to a game. There you go, boss. I'll give you some little bites. You can eat those. And uh, and yeah, so. Uh, you know, is there anything else about the Vornheim book that you wanted to mention before uh, I give my take on? on this? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I could probably fill up an hour with gushing about Vornheim. Uh, one one last thing I do want to draw attention to in it. Uh, it it weds the setting of Vornheim very cleanly to the tables and charts without having to explicitly describe how. Like, like for example, like one of the encounter charts in Vornheim, if I recall correctly, like some of the stuff you encounter, like it doesn't describe why you're encountering it. Like you go to like a certain place and I encounter, it's, it's like the encounter chart kind of tells you what would reasonably be there. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of them in those terms beforehand, but I, I do now. So like an encounter chart which says something like um, desiccated corpse, pack of hungry dogs, skeleton and a dry wind that stinks of death is different from an encounter chart that says leopard uh, group of angry warriors uh, shrieking madman and bubbling tar pit <laughs> like even without any other context between those two charts you know so much about the setting of those of those di different places mm -hmm. so that's one of the things that Vornheim does really well and subtly that uh, is another one of those things like even though maybe you don't use any of the content directly in Vornheim, you can carry that technique with you as a GM for the rest of your GM career, which is awesome. So, so uh, if I understand you, you're saying you, the table sort of uses it, it to to make sure certain elements of the setting recur. Is that what you, is that what you're talking about? Or well, not even recur necessarily, but like if you go down a dark alley and you roll in an encounter chart and you, you face some orcs, mm -hmm. that should mean something. It shouldn't just be, there are orcs now. Yeah. The orcs have a presence in the city. The, the orcs, in general, have a, have a oh, reason for being there. So when you encounter them, it isn't just orcs pop out and attack. It is, you, uh, you bump into a bunch of orcs, clearly in the middle of some shady back alley deal. They give you a really angry eye. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do? And, like, in a lot of cases, players will be like, I get the heck out of there. But, like... For thieves, so like, was I able to pickpocket him? Mm -hmm. That's a great time to make a skill roll and get into some trouble, you know. Okay. And that's that's a living part of the setting from nothing more than knowing like what your setting is like intuitively or writing that down, and then just making the right kind of encounter chart to sort of bring those elements into your game. Okay, no, that's it's, it's uh, uh, and again, I think it's um, uh, is it available on RPG now? Is it is it currently um, something people can check I think out? You, uh, I think you have to go to the Legend of the Flame Princess site to grab it. I okay. think it was when they like published, and I believe their stuff is all just on that site. It might be on on the one bookshelf stuff. I think I got mine off of uh, ordering it from uh, Legend of the Flame Princess directly, though. Okay, but it's a it's an it's a Zach S book, and yep. it's available on the uh, Lamentations of the Flame Flame Princess site. 
And uh, you know, it might if if it if it turns out it's available in RPG now, I'll probably post a link in the description below just so people can can follow it. Um, I actually probably have the link to where I bought it from, for the record, so I can send that to you. Um, but yeah, I'll put I'll put it below. And uh, and and his stuff. I mean, his stuff is good quality. I mean, I I'm more familiar with his more recent material, but he has a very good sense of how to. He he gets a, a lot of function out of out of out of tables and out of the way that the uh, I I don't know if it's similar in Vornheim but sort of marrying the art to the um, to the content. oh yeah that's, that's a whole other dimension that he does where he weds the the art to the content itself that I, I don't even have time to to describe because I literally you open the book up and like the art itself is like a table that you can drop dice onto and it generates stuff yeah. and uh, I think the ultimate takeaway from it is. Not so much that charts are good, which is kind of a simple way of thinking it, but more like if you wanted to run an RPG kind of with the same way you would play like a roguelike, you know what those are? Like procedurally generated stuff. You can do that if you know your stuff. And uh, that's the ultimate takeaway lesson of Vornheim is like this, if you need to procedurally generate something, if you don't want to plan something and you just still want it to be cool, you can do that if you just pepper these charts and do these things and, and think about things in that way. You yeah. can kind of you can prime yourself for doing that. And uh, yeah, and, and my 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 uh, my solution in design this week is, is fairly paltry compared to what. So, so I didn't have a product because I, I haven't bought anything new in the in the in the past couple of months. But um, and and I didn't have anything I felt like highlighting. But I I had a situation that emerged in one of my games where the players had attacked the temple and they had uh, they were effectively doing cleanup. Like there was the temple, a lot of the members of the temple had scattered, and mm-hmm. one of the players. Was wanted to go around and kind of pick people off one by one, and and normally that would be something fun that I would want to focus on, like sort of like a like a little bit of a first blood type session would be an enjoyable thing. But I really just felt like we have so much going on. I really need to abstract this. It's it's gonna be like it's just a question of how many he can get to because these are all like mooks and he's so powerful. So mm-hmm. I had so to make that they die kind of. What was that? Like, if he finds them, there's really no need to roll. They're basically toast. Yeah, I mean, I could roll because maybe they'll get a shot in, but it's so it was so unlikely. And I just felt like it was just, you know, and I knew what he was trying to do. And uh, and so I, I decided to just have him, in the game I was using, we had survival, you know, for the terrains that people travel on. So I used the survival roll to, um, uh, to, de- to determine, uh, how, you know, like, uh, how many people he, he, he was able to kill every like every hour or something. So, and, and the quick rule that I used was if he, and, and again, this is a T10 system against TNs. So he had to, uh, he was rolling against TN six. And so if he got a, if he got a six, I had him roll a D10 and that's how many people he killed. If he got a seven, I had him roll two D10 and that's how many people he killed. If he got an eight, oh, I, had him, I had him roll three D10. If he got a nine, he rolled four D10. If he got a 10, he rolled five D10. If he got two tens, cause it's dice pool, he rolled, uh, 60 tens and so it, it ended up being really cool because the first time he only killed like four guys but then like on the second hour he killed like 30 guys and like the <laughs> player's face lit up because he was like I'm Rambo and and he would have he would have literally been able to kill those 30 guys if we played it over the course of an hour uh, and, and ran, ran the combat but he wouldn't have it wouldn't have it wouldn't have like uh it wouldn't have registered the way it did when I just said, "Hey, you just killed like thirty something guys," and you know, over the course of a grueling hour, yeah. you take out first blood style. So. Yeah, and that's that's awesome because you're able to condense all of that all that work and all the satisfaction that comes in that work into that one little result. That's neat. Yeah, that was fun. It was it was a fun little sort of solution. Um, I don't know if I'm I don't know if it's going to come up again, but I I. I so, you know, you you do this a million times every game. You 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 know, uh, somebody tries to do something, and you either don't, you either there isn't something in the system, or there is, but you don't want to deal with it because it's it's not appropriate for what's going on or whatever. Yes. So you uh, so you come up with another uh, way of handling it, and well, and usually, you know, they don't they don't amount to anything. But this is one I was like, oh, I think I'm going to keep this one, and use it in the future. Um, yeah. And- you could even uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be for that particular thing. Like if you wanted to do it like socially, I don't I don't think while Wandering Heroes has any social stats. Uh, but like if if you assuming that it did for a second, if you want to do it socially, you could oh, make we it do like, we okay. do have social we don't have social oh. stats, but we have social skills. So it would, okay, it would. well there you go. Well, okay, so assuming like 
you are a courtier or something, and you uh, you go into this, like, you go to Magnificent Inc. or some city like that, and you're looking for this ancient society, but they sort of scatter to the five winds, and they're this guerrilla society, you could use that exact role. Uh, instead of saying hours, it would be days, and it would be a social role instead of a, a physical one, but it's role, and then see how many of the members of society you manage to gather together in a given time frame. Exact same, like, basically the same rule, you just kind of change the stakes a little bit. So that's actually a really applicable one, I think. Because what, what you're doing there is you're saying how much of a quantity of something you get for a given role, amount of time, and you're, you're tiering it based on how capable they are skill-wise. Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of a similar way to how you do combat, where you roll to see if you can hit them, and that sort of determines how well you've hit them. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I don't know, and, and in that case, I liked, I liked sort of keying it to survival because it felt very Rambo, like having it's, the survival skill be the the one that was was tied to but you know again i don't know you know for me the measure is if the players react positively i kind of feel like okay that was something that was worth (laughs) doing um and it's it's kind of a good way to sort of weed out the good choices and the bad ones oh yeah a lot of things a lot of design sounds good in your head then it's a table and you're like "Uh uh-oh that's happened. Yeah, I, I cannot tell you <laughs> that. And again, and that's why people really should play testing. That's I, I've I've definitely had stuff that looked gorgeous on paper when I tried when I sort of like wrote it out, and then when I tried it, it it was not it was not not anywhere near uh, what I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah. Oh boy. That, trust me, uh, Tian Shang went through more than a few drafts of that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh, a, it's a process. It's a very you know process. grueling yes. process. Well um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so I I guess we also had we wanted to do some uh, media recommendations. Um, yeah, I know let's you, do that too. So I know you had one you wanted to bring up. Um, okay, anyway, I think we've both seen this one. Uh, so it's not not quite the same because you recommended Swordsman Two to me, which I'd never seen before. Uh, to my sorrow, because when I saw it, I was like, yeah, all of this. I don't think we we dug into that as much as I wanted to, but like for, for the record, heavy recommendation for me too. It's a really cool movie. Uh, but we have both seen uh, the early '90s anime Ninja Scroll, which is kind of a campy, a little bit trashy uh, anime from from the early '90s, uh, which has got oh, I think it's what was it what's his name uh, Jubei, uh, the swordsman Jubei, and just this this one little divergence of one of the many things that happened to him, which is he's got to fight the Kaimon Devils and recover from this poison because the Japanese government is, well, collapsing. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to recommend it mostly because even though it's got, and I do want to caveat that recommendation because I rewatched it recently uh, because I actually got the DVD and I'm like, sweet, I haven't seen this since the 90s. I saw the edited version in the 90s Mm -hmm. on the Festival of Anime and Sci-Fi. And uh, the the one I got was the original Japanese version because I was like, I want to watch the real thing. Sort of a mistake. Um, when I say it's trashy, like it's got some pretty X-rated stuff in there that I didn't see the first time around. I made the mistake of watching it with my wife, and we were both like, "Oh Lord!" So uh, I'm going to earmark that. Like, if you don't want to see that, you know, maybe get an edited version. Get the edited version. Get the edited version. Mostly because, like, and I, I wouldn't caveat it that strongly if it wasn't clearly just there for cheesecake. Mm. But like, it doesn't further the plot. It's just, it's just trash. Uh, however. The rest of the movie is gold, and it's very much worth the watch because it's really gameable. It it is a very small cast of very capable characters with a very defined set of powers taking on a colorful mix of really powerful bad guys, kind of like a boss rush. And it's awesome. (laughs) There's a guy that can turn his skin into stone, and there's a lady that has all kinds of explosive stuff. Hey, well, we can do that in a minute, okay? All right. Go on, buddy. Not right now, but I will in a moment. Sorry, my, my dad is interfering. Someone wants to meet Tianqian. How about I give you a banana and you give me ten minutes? How's that sound? No. All right, off with you then. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take your banana. Ten minutes. That's that's how you get a little bit of time. And, <laughs> by the way, it's like I oh, I got a parking with the four year old. Um. But yeah, like, the, the point I was driving at is that all the bad guys have a nifty little set of powers, and the the they never violate the premise, even though they're way outmatched in a lot of cases. The 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 movie never violates the the premise of the powers, unlike a lot of uh, a lot of Japanese shows where like and like Dragon Ball Z does this, uh, Yu Hakusho did this, where like they'll get to a point where they are their backs against the wall and they've got no way out, 
and they'll, oh, I've got some new power I just discovered that just now, how fortunate, and that just keeps happening. Mm -hmm. Like, in this one, that never happens. It's just, no, I've only got these these certain swordsman techniques. This chick's poisonous. This guy can throw ninja stars. That's all we got. Mm -hmm. And they manage... They manage to, in, a, in very clever ways, like, interact with the environment or, or, like, do these kind of strategic things. Like, at one point, he's fighting a blind swordsman who is super better than him. He's got, like, like super senses aside from the blindness in a bamboo field. And, like, he keeps trying to beat the guy and he can't touch him. And eventually, they they sort of, they fall backwards into a way to beat him. And it's it's one of those things where, like, it, it helps. It helped me a lot as a, as a GM because, like, I think that it's easy when you're a new GM to get like really uh, into the flashiness of the the characters you're making. Like, I, I ran Exalted back in the day, so like, whenever I made NPCs that were bad guys, they had crazy powers like that. And it was easy to get sort of like in this mindset where, oh, you have to challenge them in this one particular way. They have to beat them on the system's terms. But that literally never happens in this movie. Literally every win that Lee Mu Bai gets is because of a clever use of what you might call in other games just color, like just the description of the environment and that sort of thing. And literally every victory is that, and it's always satisfying. It always makes him feel clever. It always makes you as an audience feel like, man, this guy's got something... He's got a he's got a little strategic way of dealing with this. This is really neat. And uh, I think... It, first of all, it's an entertaining movie, but second of all, that's a really great lesson for a GM to learn, where it's like, hey, look, your players aren't necessarily going to roll their D20 and roll their damage die to kill the dragon. Sometimes they'll cut a chandelier, and it will drop on the dragon, and that will kill it. And that's a valid way of overcoming the challenge. They aren't cheating, or, they are robbing themselves in the fun. They are interacting with the world you've described. Mm. And, like, nothing hammered that home for me, like watching... Like watching this this horribly outmatched swordsman continually do it in a way that was super satisfying to watch and to to be a part of. So like I highly recommend it. Yeah, Ninja Scroll. Um, is not, it, not the, what's up? What's is up? it available uh, in DVD and stuff still? Is it something that's easy to uh, Ooh, obtain a copy what? of? Um, I actually don't. Really... I have not seen Ninja Scroll since uh, when it basically when it came out on VHS here. Like when I was in high school, like in the <laughs> early nineties. Is oh yeah, what's on VHS? It. So I don't I don't remember uh, I don't remember much of it at all. Uh, so I'd kind of like to check it out between this and next uh, podcast. But um, uh, I got my DVD not too long ago. It was like a couple of years ago. Okay. So I, to the best of my knowledge, it's still available. There you go, Robert. Um, but dressed, when I buddy. first when my friend first told me about it, I thought he was saying Ninja Squirrel, and so I I was. Uh, I, I I had the complete wrong image in my head walking in to see this this uh, this show at his house. Um, he said he said I think he said you know what, what, he was talking about this great thing he saw and he said it's called Ninja Scroll, and to me that sounded like Squirrel. And it does sound like Squirrel. Yeah, and, with and, you. <laughs> and and for the longest time because because you know it was it was high school I didn't I didn't see it right away I heard him talk about it for weeks before I actually saw it and. And I was just imagining, you know, a, a, a squirrel that was a ninja, and and so, you know, which again, awesome. given the genre, you know, given, you know, it wasn't yeah, given anime, like that's unreasonable to expect. Yeah. You know? So I, I, they've got a secret squirrel already. And, so why not ninja squirrel? Why not why not have an anime answer to a secret squirrel? Ninja and we were just getting bits and pieces of anime then. You know, it was like it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was, it, and we were still calling it Japanimation back then too. This oh, like I before, that. Yeah. yeah, it was before the before you know, uh, we started calling it anime and, and I just, you know, you would get whatever came to the comic store and the, you know, the kids could buy, you know, so like one guy might get one movie, somebody else might get, you know, you, there wasn't that much going around. Um, and so at least where I live, um, but yeah, I definitely will, uh, will, I'm going to try to pick that up before next, uh, next podcast. The movie that I want to recommend is a film called what price honesty it's actually on Amazon Prime, so it's, if somebody has Excellent. Prime, it's fairly easy to see. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a Shaw Brothers movie, and it's about a group of constables. And they live in this world where the officials are all corrupt, and there's this one character played by Jason Pipeo. I can't remember the character's name, but he's this upright, just, righteous constable trying to be righteous in in a world that is not righteous 
and the central question of the movie is like, you know, like what, what is it worth it? Like, is it worth being a good person when every when when there's like there's no reward for it? You're certainly gonna either die or be dismembered by the end of this film, and you know your loved ones might pay the price too. There's like there's there's no like because usually in like a wuxia movie, right? Even even if the character if the main like you know it's just sort of expected. You know the main character might die in a blaze of glory in the end. But if they do, there's the glory, or there's the there's the you know you know that they're going to become a martyr that'll it'll have some meaning for the, for them to die in that moment. And this is a movie that makes clear there's n- there's no meaning to be gained in the you know in the in the road that the guy's walking walking. He's 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 being good for its own sake and nothing more. And 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 the viewer sort of has to wonder, would I be able to do that too? Like like is it really worth it? Um, yeah, is that even the right choice? Is another question. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a it's really well done because it does a good job. You, you it could be mishandled. It's a very easy. Uh, oh yeah, concept. You need to detour that into a more banal cynicism, which I think is what I'd be tempted to do with it. it. Sounds like they actually are clever, though, much more well, so than I. So well, they did it in a way that I felt like I was engaging the movie's question actively as I was watching it. So. I think part of it was they did paint a very bleak moral landscape. You have, you know, like all of the people surrounding this character are corrupt and the people who aren't corrupt sort of they recognize like the way to survive is to sort of, you know, just get with the corruption. And and he's the sort of one character that digs in his heels. But when he does that, it has consequences, not just for himself, but the other people around him. Do you know what I mean? And so they do a good job of 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 uh of making it a not an easy road to follow um, right because again it would be easy to make him the lone righteous martyr but if you don't do that if you make it like no you're not only choosing your destiny you're choosing the destiny of a lot of people that are important to you as well is that worth it is is good for goodness sake worth it whenever you're paying this much and they're paying this much like that's a great question i i, I hopefully it sounds like it was it was carried off really well. It was, and and I should say it's 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 got plenty of good fight scenes in it too. It's 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 more classic Shaw Brothers style, so it's not like we saw a lot the the other night with Swordsman Two, but uh, but it's got uh, Sun Xian in it, who's so great at, the, at kicking and is you know is in a lot of the Venom movies, and so uh, and 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 Jason Pipey, I was you know a classic. Shaw Brothers actor, and it's just the fight choreography is great, but that's not the point of this movie. You, you you will be impressed by the fight scenes, but you won't you won't dwell on them a lot. And the and one of the villains is played by Lolier, who um who's also just an outstanding uh, uh, bad guy in these movies. And it's one of these movies that has multiple bad guys. There's like a hierarchy of villainy going on, and and so you have. You have the Lolier character, who's one of the more enjoyable villains, but you also have the corrupt sheriff and the the really nasty district magistrate, and just you know all these other characters that are uh, doing all kinds of horrible things to the local community to to fatten their own pockets. Um, but it is a, it's a fun movie, and it's a constable movie. That's a there's a lot of these films that feature constables, and in terms of gaming, that's always usable because it's good when you uh, have an infrastructure to work with in a campaign and. Uh, and, I, and I definitely recommend if people like to run Wuxia games to see as many constable movies as they can, not just because the players might be constables, but because they might be dealing with constables as they as they go on their adventures and and and, and get into legal trouble themselves. So, uh, oh, yeah. So it's always kind of handy just to sort of know you don't have to know like all the specifics. There are some great books that dive into the details of of the constables during different periods in the history, but the movies will give you the gist of of you know how how these things operate um and so so yeah so that was my recommendation all right so the the next thing we wanted to talk about was um uh clearing up misconceptions and today you want to talk about game mastering misconceptions and uh i know we only got about 20 more minutes or so so we're going to try to keep this fairly tight but uh why don't we kind of get into that And this was something that you brought up so i'll let you lead the uh the discussion Okay, yeah. Uh, specifically, there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding the GM's role, but I think the one of the ones that I encounter really frequently, one of the what I want to call persistent ones, is the the GM as God, um, rather than like the GM as like kind of like referee uh, sort of thing. Um, and I think it's easy to, and it, it's this isn't like just a, a some kind of small level only forum people think this like. 
game designers who are really influential in the industry have like gone on tangents about, oh, I hate the GM as God, I hate the role of the GM, I hate that. And like, there's this fundamental misconception about that that I think is really important. And it's, it's like you said, this is something that's actually a really very small, very discreet uh, thing, the, the misconception itself. So it's easy to kind of have a tight conversation about it. Uh, and my my perspective on it was the, the, the line where people start arguing is whenever you go from, I'm the GM, so here's the situation, and I'll arbite the rules if it becomes necessary, to, okay, I said there was a tree here, but what I meant was there's actually not a tree here when you have an idea. Mm-hmm. So like when you, when you start editing, whenever you start t- putting stuff in or taking stuff out of the stuff you've introduced in a way that isn't just due to like the players misinterpreting it or the senses of the characters. Like it's reasonable to say there was an injury there all along. You didn't see it. Or, you know, I misspoke instead of a fir tree. It was a, it was a Douglas fir tree. It was a pine or something yeah. that that's understandable. But whenever you're like straight up maliciously, like, okay, the player now has an idea to use that tree to topple on the, the dojo and take it out that way. So I'm just going to edit the tree out. Cause that makes a yeah. quote unquote better what challenge. Tree? What tree? <laughs> Yeah, I don't. There's no tree there. I know a said tree, but there isn't one. Like oh, whenever yeah. you do that, that I think is where the the persistent god GM uh, comes from. Is that that the editor GM? Okay, so you're saying when people encounter a GM like that, that's what breeds sort of. Because I've seen. And I don't know if I'm a hundred percent catching what what you're referring to, but but people who will who will not like the idea of the GM being given all of the powers that a GM is normally given is that. Is that so? Yeah, it's the, the God about... GM thing is yeah. The God GM thing is taken to mean that the classic way of doing GMing, which is a very uh, has a, a, a dimension of authority between players and, G, and GM, like that that is bad in just general sense. Like whenever people say I hate the role of the GM, I hate God GM, I hate GM as God. I want it to be more like GM as collaborator. It's mm-hmm. usually what they're angling for, and I think what they are conflating. Uh, is the GM as an authority figure with the GM as a poor authority figure. I get you. So, uh, so okay, so yeah, I, I now I see what you're saying. So somebody who's misusing the normal, the normal role that a GM would have, and then that creates the impression that that that, that that's sort of the, that that's the intent of, of, uh, of, of, of what a GM, like, that, that the, you know, most GMs are trying to avoid doing that. We're assuming, yes. Um, and but some people might be assuming, no, that's what they're trying. That's you know, left to their own devices. That's what a GM would do, um, right? Or left to their own devices, or even that that is another, another thing I've seen characterized is if you make a GM authority figure, that's the inevitable conclusion is that they become you know absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think GMs have absolute power. I think very much they are referees of the rules and they are the guy that is in charge of the stuff that is initially in the setting. But I don't, I don't think that GMs have godlike powers because just like, uh, like a a referee in soccer can't kick another ball onto the field all of a sudden or grab the ball and start running with it or some crazy stuff like that. That's the same thing. It would be poor form for them to do that. It is poor form for the GM to do something like say there is a tree and then there is no tree. Uh, going back to that example. So, like, there there are boundaries what the GM can do. You, you have to respect... Like, once you introduce elements to the game, you have to respect that everyone... That, that's not your property anymore. That's kind of everyone at the table's shared mind space. And you can't just go in and start messing with that because you're undermining the the, the sort of uh, permanency of it. You're, you're making it seem like whatever my whim is is what happens. Not, no, we're making this situation and I am... I'm the guy that plays the the character of like physics yeah. and stuff like that in it. So I'm much I'm much more passive. Well, they're kind of like a democratically elected referee in a way. Like the players and the way the players vote is by their reactions to what the GM is doing. If the GM makes really questionable calls all the time, then the players start, you know, complaining about I mean it just becomes obvious to everybody at the table. You know, if you, yeah, well, if you they're not going to stand for that crap yeah. anymore. And and I mean and, and I think every GM who's been doing it for a while that that isn't oblivious uh, is, is going to, you know, be tuned in to sort of what the players, uh, what the, what the mood in the room is towards them. You know what I mean? Like you, like you can sense when players are not digging what you're doing and, and it would be a, you know, 
uh, classic bad GM would probably be somebody who just kind of digs their heels in and is um, is sort of you know uh, just by will alone trying to make things go the way they want or uh, you know I, I, I've occasion I mean I have not seen that many bad GMs in my in my, my experience. Uh, I, I've well, seen you see, a few with feet, kind of. So like a bad GM is like a bad manager; they don't get hired again. Yeah, you know. Well. That, yeah, that's exactly it. Because the I, I mean, I've seen. I've obviously I've been to a table where it's been where, where GMs have done you know a bad oh. job. But <laughs> but but what I what but what I but it's usually just been one time because I show up at the game, the GM runs something. I see that he's not or she is like the kind of GM I don't really like dealing with, and I I just don't play in that game. And uh and so I think there is a voting with your feet part of it too. Um, I mean I and and to be completely honest. Whenever I have encountered GMs like that, it's normally been at venues like game stores or at um, conventions or something like that, where it's somebody that I'm meeting that I wouldn't otherwise like interact. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't otherwise be in have an opportunity to play with this person necessarily. So, I, mostly because, and I think you and I share this in common, and a lot of people that play share this in common. I play with my friends yeah. and people that I that I deal with socially. So with with friends, you have the advantage not only of an ongoing relationship, but of an open and helpful communication line. So like if I'm a bad GM, my wife's a player. She'll tell me. I'll hear about it, and I'll know how to improve for next time. If it's just someone you've like just met, or, or I think a con is a common situation for that. You don't have that luxury. Yeah. Your whole interaction with them is as an authority figure. Which is the same thing as your whole interaction with someone that is them being like a cop or a manager or something. Like that's all you know about them. You don't see them like go home, put their dogs up. You don't drink a beer with them and then talk to them over a game. That's just not. You don't have that dimension with them. And like I could see if like your your almost sole experience was cons getting that kind of negative connotation to the GM. Uh, it, that really vanishes when you get to have an ongoing relationship with the person that you're you're playing with. Yeah, no, that's true. And I mean, a, a problem GM, a problem player can definitely color the whole experience. That's that's you know, that's always been true. It always will be. Um, it's like saying I, a, a real jerk can color a conversation. Well, of course they can. Yeah, but we should still talk. We should still have conversations, right? Like that's the yes. that's sort of my attitude. Um, but I can I can I mean again I'm I'm not. I'm not particularly opposed to other approaches to GMing and things like that, but I, I, I I'm not, I'm not, um, I, I don't find that it's a, I, I don't think there's something inherently wrong with GMs having, you know, the traditional role that the GM has in a game. And I think that that, uh, I think it's just, you know, people just have to understand, you know, it's, it's a social, it's a social environment gaming. And so you're going to, the, all the problems that can happen in a monopoly game, like we were talking about before, can happen in a role playing game. And and if you're and if you're playing monopoly with people that are like real jerks, it can be a miserable experience. And the same thing can happen with uh, if you're playing, you know, with um, a GM who is either a jerk or just not particularly adept at the role. Uh, you know, it can be a miserable experience. So, um, yeah. But it, I, it helps. Um, it helps have a conciliatory tone, especially like like we're we're talking about having an ongoing relationship. I have a friend who recently took up the mantle of GM for the first time, and of course, yearly sessions are awkward and not perfect. But it's really like again, you only have a the only feedback they've ever gotten as a GM is what you're about to give them. Mm. You know, maybe soften it a little, maybe realize that they're learning, and that's the part of the 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 joy of the game is going to be learning along with them that's that's okay well, it doesn't there, have to be perfect there's also the dirty secret that like nobody really gives honest feedback at a game you have to kind of feel the room like like i've yes. i've i've solicited feedback from people and very rarely do i feel like i get like i like i i, I like just as an example you know if you if you are uh oh, i'm sorry could you hear me okay yeah i'm just oh. listening more. oh okay i'm sorry um <laughs> You know, if if, 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 if if there's some element to the game, like maybe uh, you're playing at a cert, like a super lethal level for whatever reason, like you've kind of decided you want to have a more uh, a, a, a more sort of competitive and 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 carnage ridden campaign. Uh, if you ask the players, are they okay with that? My experience is usually the first response they give is not the honest response, and you have to you have to kind of feel things out a bit and find, you know what I mean? Like people are often reluctant to, to, to give, uh, 
to, to give GM advice or give feedback to a GM that they think is either going to hurt the GM's feelings or is going to make them look bad. And so, uh, so I've just, I, I think that you have to kind of feel the room uh, of the game and, and, and that's not an easy skill to acquire. It takes time to sort of realize, you know, what, you know, what, but, but you, you do pick up on it eventually. Like you do start to realize, you know, okay, this person's not okay with this, this person, you know, it's something that you kind of, you kind of get a sense of. Um, I have never had that happen. Like usually when I elicit honest feedback, what I will say is it's okay. Just don't spare my feelings. Like what did you think? How was it? And I'll I'll keep that really conversational. Like let's be frank here, Tone. And, and, and you find yeah, you get that's... and you get you get a, you get honest feedback that way. I, I'm, maybe I'm just tone deaf. Like maybe I'm just mi- <laughs> missing the crucial skill of reading the room. But, but as far as I can tell, their feedback. And the way they act in character and their engagement level with the game seems to, I mean, they, they seems to be one for one. It seems like they're just giving me 100% frank feedback. So okay, that, okay. That might I, be mean, ultra- maybe a pati- I mean, I, I mean, I do have players who give honest feedback. I have some players who give, you know, very honest feedback. Is, you know, <laughs> a lot of people know. Uh, but, but I've also, I've, I've met a large number of players who just, they'll say like, oh, yeah, I'm okay with this in the game. And then it just becomes apparent to me that they're not over the course of the campaign and i have to like kind of more gently ask them you know is that you know is that and it becomes clear that's maybe not okay or uh or i'll i'll you know some or another thing that you might see is uh people instead of telling you they don't like the game they'll just you know not show up at the game um and and (laughs) yeah that's that's the one that's and and if that's happening to you you need to take stock like if if you if people are not showing up it's usually not because of the reasons that are being listed. It's because they're not, they're not, they're not enjoying the game. And so, if that's the case, you have to kind of take stock. Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I've I've gamed long enough that I've had sort of the complete experience. I think as a GM, where uh, you know, uh, when I first started, you know, I I was I was in high school, and 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 I think I think among younger GMs, it's particularly. Uh, difficult to navigate that kind of stuff because you don't, you know, no, you know, when you're that age, it's really not easy to sort of hurt people's feelings and have your feelings hurt. But you, as you get older, you just get a thicker skin. And, um, and yeah, you know. that's you don't even have a read on your own feelings when you're a teenager. I remember gaming when I was a, a kid, and like a lot of times, I would be in a bad mood and not be fully cognizant of it like I am nowadays. And, like, the session would be really awkward. And then later on, everyone would be like, were you in a bad mood? And I'd be like, no. Yeah. And I thought about it. And I'm like, wait, yes. Yes, I was. Yeah. I'm stupid. No. Sorry. And, and that's what – no, but that's what it is. Like, you, like feeling the room. Feel, like, like I can I, – I usually can tell when people are angry about work or something when they show up at the table. And I take that into account, you know. Um, Sometimes you got to have a few more goblins to kill, you yeah. know. So – This goblin looks just like your boss. I rip him in half. But this to is bring a little it, catharsis. It's okay to help, Jen. But to bring it back to what you were saying, it sounds like uh, you know the the GM has limits on uh, on. Kind of, I mean, this ties to what we were saying because if you if you if you even though you have like all the authority that you know the game you know bestows to you as a GM, if if you if you don't use that well, players are going to leave the campaign. Players are going to complain. But you know. The, you have to deal with the fact that the players are receiving whatever it is you're putting out there, and they're going to be uh, reacting to it positively or negatively. And so, if you if you if you make blatantly bad calls, that that tends to produce reactions among the players. Um, yeah, and it, I think to to some degree, as I've gotten older, my calls have gotten they have a stronger verisimilitude to them because I simply know more about how real life works. And that's that's made my GMing better. Like when I was a young GM, I think that my primary influence was like anime and my own fantasies. I didn't think much about like, well, how much did armor actually weigh? That didn't matter. There was a negative in the rules. Uh, so to some degree, that's that's just the more confident you get about the knowledge you have about the way the real world works, the more confident you are with making those rulings. Yeah. Uh, I find if I'm not confident about something, like especially if I have an actual expert of that thing at the table. I just elicit feedback when I'm making the ruling. I don't feel like that breaks the the, the wall between, you know, person with authority and, and person with skill, you know? Like, um, what's a good example here? Uh, my, I'm trying to think of one. I'm, I'm struggling now. It was like, oh, I'll have a great example. I don't. 
Well, uh, I, the, can, the, I can think of one for you if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Uh, I, I, had a, I had a player uh, who was a translator for Chinese web novels in my campaign, and he, he knew a lot more than I did about Chinese culture and Chinese language. And, and so I would often, uh, number one, I gave him permission to interject. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, we play some, you know, you know, I told him not to be a jerk about it, but I, I, but, but I, but I gave him permission to sort of step in and say, Hey, you know, what you guys are doing is way off. Like in, 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 in you know, in, in, this is how it would probably go down. You know what I mean? Or, Oh, that word, it actually means that, you know, it, 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 it added, it added something to the game that I thought, I thought overall improved the, uh, how, how it felt. So. I, you know, I, I didn't mind deferring to somebody who clear, I mean, what am I going to do? Claim that I know how to speak a language I don't like, you know, like yeah. it's, it's a, you, and, and, and I think, I think it's obviously with something like a language, it, it, it's, 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 well, language, easy. culture, I'm sorry, um, language, culture, a lot of, a lot of the sciences are like that. Yeah. Like if you've an architect in the group and like, it's okay. It's okay to uh, to ask him if something would work yeah. architecturally. It's not going to break anyone's heart, you know. As a matter of fact, I find that showing, having those little moments of humbleness as a GM is super. Like that really sends a signal to your players where it's like, hey, look, I'm just a person too. I, I am not like a disembodied voice behind a coat yeah. rack. No, I mean, <laughs> so. I'll say I say this all the time. I, I my my, my uh, I, when I was in college, I studied history. And one of the most common things I heard historians say was, I don't know. I, I cannot tell you how often I, I, I encountered that answer to questions I had. And it would be usually be followed by, I don't know, let me look that up. You know, let me let me go try to find an answer for you. Um, and, and I feel like I feel like uh, with GMs, there's a lot of pressure to not say, I don't know. Um, yeah, but but you, some like you're losing your authority. But yeah. like, I don't don't worry about that. Yeah. yeah, don't wear the authority on your sleeve. Be be calm with it. Yeah, I, I I have no problem telling people I don't know something, and 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 I'm and I'll and I'll be frank if I if I if there's like like, especially if it's something where there's like a clear answer that I'm supposed to have, like it's a science related thing, like what happens when you mix these two chemicals together, and I have to come up with an answer, and I don't necessarily know. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I will just say I don't know, but I'm gonna assume that it's something like this. And if anyone wants to interject, go ahead. You know, that's... I, that, that's a good move. The whole, I don't know, but here's my assumption. Yeah. Nowadays, we have the internet, so that that's not so much a thing you have to do. But sometimes, like, I had a player who wanted to smithy a sword and ask how long that took. And I was like, huh, I don't actually have any idea. I'm going to say a week. Yeah. Ever cool that? That worked. It was, it was a table rule. And the thing about those is that, as rulings, they're not as concrete as something written down in the rule books. You can revisit them later. Like, okay, that should have taken a month. But due to whatever circumstance, it only took a week. Let's move on. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and like you said, with the internet, obviously, you could always have a player Googling things for you and just functioning oh, yeah. as like a, a personal Look encyclopedia. Up. I do have a player who kind of does that for us, who uh, is happy to look up uh, you know, how, how is gunpowder made or how, you know, whatever question happens to emerge, um, you know, that can be handy too. Um, but, uh, but it can also be distracting if you're trying to sort of balance that with what the mechanics of the game say would happen. Um, yeah, you, you should limit the, uh, uh, just point of good advice. You should limit the amount of times that you ask things outside the game for an answer to whenever it's actually important and comes up as a thing that needs an answer. You shouldn't just be constantly grabbing trivia to throw in your game. And so, and we are we are coming up on uh, oh, the yeah. end of the episode. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end it here. But we're gonna be back. We're gonna be back. I think what we say like every two weeks or something. So we'll yeah, we'll by week or something. Yeah. So we'll be back. We'll have you know maybe some new talk topics. Hopefully, I'll watch Ninja Scroll by by the time we, we return. And uh, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. This was the first episode, so we're gonna be sort of hashing through these concepts as we go and trying to sort of improve things. But I think I think we did a pretty good job today. So. Uh, so hopefully, uh, you know, uh, when we come back, we'll have, uh, we'll have a, uh, we'll have a whole set of new topics to go over. And, uh, anyways, we'll talk to you later and, you know, have a great day. 